hey Arnold. All right. Thank you. This question comes from Jackie Maroon. Now, if I mispronounce your name, please, I apologize. I'm probably going to repeatedly do so. Please tell us your Myers-Briggs. Okay. There's a website online, which I'll display right now, which has me pegged as an INFJ, which is false. And for whatever reason, this has five votes. This is incorrect. I'm an introverted type of person who relies heavily on my intuition, and I'm fairly quick to draw conclusions, and I happen to like to think or love to think. I engage repeatedly in imperishable, continual mental activity. So that makes me an int J. That is INTJ. In fact, my first company was named Int J. The word on the street. So that's the next user who's asking this question. Do you believe that a psychedelic drug can cut off your brain's natural filter and that it allows you to see beyond the veil of our reality? I've never taken a psychedelic, but heard people say that while taking DMT as a group, they were seeing the same thing. That they had a group hallucination. Okay, so that's the question. I believe there's evidence that both are the case, that psychedelics removes what sifts sensorily, and that it modulates what is existing, like an Instagram filter as well. As for people reporting the same experience, I hear this repeatedly, but I don't know of any studies that have been done on this, at least not in a major journal, and I don't know why not, given how apparently replicable this result is, and it seems like something that's easily falsified. As for the term group hallucination, I'm not a fan of the term. It's an unreliable construct, and I can talk more about that afterward. In other words, there is no such thing as a mass hallucination. You hear people say this. L. Johnson says, Kurt, big fan. Do you meditate? So I've tried, and I continually try, but I don't find that it helps. So I've discontinued it, and I've recontinued it many times, and I I just find that it doesn't help me. I've tried it for years. It's difficult, generally, to stress me. I don't have many negative thoughts, barring recent events, mental events, let's say, which, if you're a frequent surveyor of the Toe Channel, you should likely, or you would likely know about this, you can find out more about from the Carl Friston episode and the A.H. Almas episode. I talk a minor bit about it toward the end of the Diana Pasolka video as well. So I don't find that meditation helps my sleeping, nor does it help my imagination, so my creativity. Some people say that meditation can function as a method of almost sleep. So Seinfeld said that transcendental meditation recharges his batteries. That is to say, if you need to nap for an hour, what you can do is meditate for 15 minutes or so instead, and you should feel just as refreshed, if not more. I don't find that to be the case for myself. Godfrey Opa says, what is your interest in mathematics? It's fun. For me, it's fun. It's also the language that the universe uses to, well, uses physically. At least it appears to be the language that the universe uses physically. I also find it extremely difficult at times, and I tend to like to do what's mentally or cognitively difficult, simply to prove it to myself, because I'm much like David Goggins, Though he's with physical work, he will push himself to the physical limit. I like to do that for myself mentally. I push myself in the mental domain as much as I can. In high school and university, whenever there were multiple choices for a course, I would just ask the question, which one's harder? If there was two versions of a math course, which one's the more abstract one? Which one's the more difficult one? I will take that one, the more difficult one, simply to bolster my 
self-pride. Gonzo asks, hey Kurt, I want to learn physics. Where do I begin and where do I go? Well, it depends on which part of physics. If it's the theoretical end of the physics spectrum, then I would say you could watch the crash course on physics. There'll be a thumbnail right now about that, which gives an overview. It also gives general learning tips for math and physics. If it's more of the practical that you're looking for, then Brilliant is a great website to use. And, well, websites akin to that. And also the next question. So Caroline Cherry says, would taking a course in linear algebra familiarize someone about quantum mechanics more than any other math? I would say yes. And I would say that my advice would be to master it inside and out and backward, and you'll be unstoppable. Another course that's not talked about much is representation theory, or another field of mathematics, representation theory. So representation theory and linear algebra. I would say pick some course, some textbook, some PowerPoint slide, and understand each equation, every implication arrow, every equality sign, every theorem, assiduously, every definition, every detail, and you'll be extremely powerful. You'll have an anchor to rest any future knowledge that's mathematical or physical, and even some in the emotional, spiritual domain. Personally, I like to be as detailed as I possibly can, though I understand that sometimes, and often is the case, while detail can be more befuddling than it is illuminating, and that's one of the reasons that people in, well, that's one of the reasons why people in the popular science domain, like, for example, Neil deGrasse Tyson and so on, I keep picking on him, but I, I don't mean to, I apologize, Neil, but people like him have just inundated you repeatedly with the same wave particle duality and Gravity is like a fabric of space-time bending and so on, and it doesn't give you much of much insight, and it's as if you're still at the elementary school level. So what Toe is aiming to do is to bridge the gap between where the pop where I feel the popular science people have been stuck for the past forty years, so that's here, and then where the universities are. There's a large unaddressed segment of highly, highly motivated and extremely intelligent and curious people, and that's the Toe audience, though it's nowhere near as philanthropic as I'm making it seem. I'm an extremely self-serving person. So much of Toe, if not all of Toe, is essentially to rectify my own bewilderment constantly. I see what other people say. Sorry, I see other people saying so-and-so is obvious, to me, it's not obvious. Almost none of it is. I'm creating what I wish existed for my former self while illuminating my future self. So my current self, my future self. And in a sense, it's like a bridge from the past to the future simultaneously. It's difficult to explain. The problem with simplified explanations is that they may be correct, but then they disorient you. And you think that the world can't operate in that manner. So for example, Richard Borchards said that he can't understand biology because when reading the biology textbooks, he realizes that a cell can't function in the manner that the textbooks suggest. So another one is the curvature of space-time is like a balloon in the middle of a bed and so on. You get a siphon and it's like a black hole. And it just leaves much to be desired. For me, it leaves more questions than it answers. That is to say that one can make analogies with those analogies, and then they break down. And it, it, it tends to be only after years and years of studying does one realize that those reduced explanations, those simplified, low-resolution explanations, do indeed accurately represent what's trying to be explained. However, you have to see it from different vantage points. And you, in order for you to see why squinting with your eyes at this intricate object produces that simplified image. Explaining some concept in a manner that a child would understand, sure, a child would think that they understand it, but the inquisitive child would realize that, well, that can't be how the world works. And it's only after one delves deeper into the details or the particularities of a given topic that 
you come to realize that the boiled down version is actually extremely lucid and clever. So Caroline, all of that is to say, understand, pick some subject, some lecture, some PowerPoint slide, if you want to make it as, as tiny as that and understand it, understand every single equation, every single equal sign, every single implication arrow, because broadly speaking, understanding mathematics or physics happens in three stages. So one is the childlike simplified explanation that we're all told, and we're all pretty much at that level because we've been told about string theory as well. You take an extended region of a of an electron, you make it into a loop or you make it into an open string. And well, then you wonder, well, how does it operate? Okay, so you have some high level understanding of it. So that's stage one. Then stage two is the rigorous definition. Then stage three is the level of understanding where you then see why this rigorous definition makes sense with the initial one and vice versa, where it becomes intuitive. Now the Toe podcast, you can think of it as coming to the understanding that the majority of people are already at stage one and they're being talked to consistently like they're not at stage one, like they're at stage zero. And we need to progress to stage two and then hopefully stage three. So the Toe podcast is about stage two. The universities are about stage three, but that's extremely difficult. Victor Yaki, can you share with your audience what you're reading to prepare for specific upcoming videos? I think it would help a previously unstudied but curious mind like my own, learn even more. So let's say I have an interview coming up. I look up the person's corpus. Usually it's a person rather than a group of people. And then I see what interviews they've done, what academic articles they've published. I may sort that by most cited or most interesting to myself. I make a note of any relevant other infos like books they may have written or articles written about them. I try to read enough of other people's commentary, as well as their own commentary on their work to get an understanding of their point of view. I may do a podcast on what it takes to prepare for a toe podcast. I may do not a podcast, maybe a video, let's say. And if people are interested, let me know. Step up, start up. Enjoy your time away. What I find super fascinating about you is your pause moments in pause moments how in the heat of the conversation you're able to do it and analyze and come back with a very authentic point instead of getting lost or taken away you must be mentally drained afterward because it takes plenty of energy on that subject do you take any supplements for focus or have a diet i know you mentioned that you don't eat before your conversations so for supplements for focus no i've tried virtually every nootropic that exists and I don't find any of them works for me except for caffeine and phenobut. However, the latter I take perhaps maybe once every two months or even less because I am terribly afraid of getting addicted to any of these supplements or substances. As for fasting, I almost never eat prior to a podcast. For whatever reason, I feel like it's cheating. It's like me being a surient in some manner and so I put it off until I have my reward so it's almost like I feel like the same feeling that I get if I was to eat my dessert prior to the salad is the feeling that I get that same feeling of of voraciousness indulging in my own voraciousness as if I was to eat prior to a podcast to me it's not it's not decorous it's not correct it's not right I need to do the podcast and then reward myself with food. And I love, I love food. I, I surf it. I gorge. I gorge myself past the point of oversaturated. Sorry, past the point of oversaturation. I love to eat. This one of my, I love to eat with my wife. Like I don't like to eat alone. I love to eat with my wife. Additionally, when it comes to the fasting, I don't, frequently fast. I intermittently fast virtually every day, but I don't fast for 48 hours or 72 hours, except perhaps once a month or, or once every two weeks or so. And the reasons for fasting aren't to do with cognition, but instead simply timing. I don't have the time to eat. I find that I like to reward myself by eating. 
afterwards. So I eat just once a day or twice a day. And that's after I've done the majority of my work, if not all of my work. To sum up, I'm a glutton. I I relish food and I I treat it sacredly. Fanny Ram. How much do you usually prep for a talk and how much of a free ride do you get from your educational background? Brackets undergrad. I tend to have to relearn almost all of what I've learned as an undergrad, and I realized that I had mislearned it back then if I've learned it at all, which is why in the crash course on physics I go through details of how how I think a particular physical concept should be thought of, or physics should be taught, or mathematics should be taught, and it's to avoid this the confusion that I had. I was never the type to study in groups, nor ask the professor for help, and that has hindered me greatly, because much of how people study is in groups. If you go to a university and you see a study group, almost all of their misapprehensions are settled there, whereas for me, I don't have that, and I wasn't, I wasn't open enough to talk to other people when I was in university. And I just feel like I have virtually no one to talk to. So almost all of me trying to solve my own non-comprehensions happens solitarily. So for example, one would be how does a certain Lee group sit inside another Lee group? I have to figure that out on my own by reading and by watching videos. And it's extremely painful and protracted. As for how long does it usually take to prepare, I would say about a week per interviewee. So that's six full days of work. Okay, now Fanny Ram has a second part to this. If you are a non-math major, say engineering, how long would it take for you to get up to speed with gauge theories? That depends heavily on who is teaching it. So if you're lucky enough to have a great teacher, then, well, it can be extremely quickly. The issue is that as soon as you've learned some subject, it becomes extremely easy to underestimate how arduous it was to learn that subject to begin with, how difficult the concept is. And one is trying to explain to a student who has no clue what this... I'm trying to explain... I'm trying to do this vaguely. And I, I think it would be better if I gave a concrete example, but hopefully you can understand what I'm saying. When you finally understand something you take for granted how difficult it is to come to that understanding, especially after there's been some time from once you finally understand it to when you're teaching it. So many teachers don't see where the confusions lie for students because they've forgotten what it's like to not understand the concept. The people who are most skilled at researching aren't necessarily the best lecturers. In fact, at the University of Toronto, they don't hire based on lecturing abilities almost at all. They hire based on your ability to conduct research and advance the field. And those aren't the same. So you can look up the... Well, you can look up a lecture on Yang Mills theory by David Gross. I think it was about the Yang Mills Millennium Prize puzzle. And you can see how scattered it is. You can also see how he doesn't write in any clear manner. And that person, David Gross, is a Nobel Prize winning physicist. He's at the top of his domain. It's rare that you get individuals like Ed Witten and Terry Tao who are masterful at teaching and they're at the peak of their subject. So to answer the question, if you're studying by yourself, then maybe it would take one year. If you're studying under someone who knows, then maybe it would just take a month. Stephen Wolfram, now this is a third part to the same user Fanny Ram. Stephen Wolfram speculates particles are tiny black holes. Does Pius's theory look consistent with that? I don't think so. I need to understand what Wolfram means when he says that particles are like tiny black holes. You'll hear from many places that some object is related to some profound one, some benign, some, let's say some mundane object is related to some profound one, and vice versa. In, in virtually every toe that's advanced, especially the more imaginative ones, they tend to lack the rigor. Though this isn't the case for Wolfram, he's indeed rigorous, as rigorous as, as anyone else. But I believe he's speculating using analogies. 
and those and he's perhaps purposefully being provocative perhaps not perhaps he means those words in the way that they're fairly literally interpreted dark forest asks have you ever considered writing a book and if so what would be the subject matter i am writing whether or not it's for publication or my own edification that's to be determined right now it's the latter i see that people who have an extreme amount of knowledge in a certain domain tend to write a book about it but then they get interviewed and then they get criticized from people as being grifters because they have something to promote now and it doesn't help i don't think that's see people criticize many i won't name names but people criticize i think that's something that needs to stop as soon as there's a single dollar motive then their entire motive is questioned and ideally you want people to be doing what they like to do or what they love to do for a living ideally you would want society constructed in such a manner that people are doing what they love for a living whether money is there or not you ideally would like that it would be great if everyone could not have to do what they dislike and contribute to society and themselves when people criticize individuals for making money off of a book or off of their knowledge well oftentimes they're doing what they love to do and so by criticize and making money off of it and so by criticizing people for having a financial motive it gives the implication that people shouldn't do what they love to do and it gives that implication to others but mainly to yourself it's it's one of those phrases grifter and the word cult and woo and there's certain phrases to me that if one was to limit or to remove that from one's vocabulary you would see how constructive and building the world could be and yourself can be those words are essentially judgmental and dismissive and i i understand what it's like to be judgmental and dismissive because that's my nature i have that in spades i have that to an abject degree i'm judgmental and disparaging to others in my internally and i found that the more i can disband just those words the more that i allow myself to put out an effort to learn more about the subject from a neutral to positive inquisitive stance a loving stance if i'm at my best so those words of that person's a grifter or that person's a so and so i i see this in myself as an indication that i've i have my own internal perimeters rather than it reflecting something of the objective world and it's easy for myself and well it's easy to delude oneself into thinking that no this is just a dispassionate assessment of objective facts when it's actually a justification for the limitation of one's own knowledge or the or a justification for not trying to understand someone else's point of view and steal man them Okay, Troy James Monger says, "Do you intend to continue to synthesize a toe into a grand unified toe documentary? You've gotten a lot of excellent material. Would you consider a book or something that recaps the beautiful minds that you've surveyed and that abstracted experience of cataloging and foiling?" As for a grand unified toe, that's an interesting way of of putting it, Troy. I have inklings here and there. At some point in a few years I'll have something meaningful to say on the matter. David Shui or Shoy says, "How would you solve the hard problem of consciousness? There's nothing about physical parameters in terms of which we can deduce what it feels like. You can't go from pure quantities to qualities." Well, I would say that I'm not trying to solve the hard problem. I'm trying to understand the hard problem and other problems. I think in about 3 years or so I may have some I may have a or multiple proposals for a solution just judging by my own intuitions currently and the ideas that I incessantly have so perhaps in 6 to 7 years I may have a verbally coherent formulated idea or two or three as for the second claim that there's nothing about physical parameters and so on so on, I don't know that's it's great that you have such certainty I wish I shared that Brian Redman says would what would be the holy grail interview in your opinion Douglas Hofstetter for me 
Daniel Dennett, the Dalai Lama, and Dan Ariely. So those are the four Ds, let's say. And what's cropped up recently, someone that I would love to speak to would be Camille Vasquez. There's also the two Miyazakis. So that is the filmmaker and the video game designer, so Hidetaki Miyazaki, and I've forgotten the first name of the filmmaker. I would love to speak to either one of them and Hideo Kojima, who's a video game creator. I also would like to talk to Todd Howard. However, I'm a Sony fanboy, and I'll be boycotting Starfield. Mike says, since you've begun this journey and have been flooded with such deep intellectual insight, how has it affected you personally? What do you believe? Have you noticed a change in yourself? Is this knowledge making a difference in your life and how you perceive or experience reality? Does all of this intellectual information increase a sense of knowing or is it just the opposite? Well, I would say it's not pleasant in many ways, in many, 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 many ways, and it's superlative in others. I wouldn't say that it's all intellectual theory. I say that because this medium, even this right now, it's a video, but it's also propositional, primarily propositional. But on the day-to-day, -day, it's experiential. And that's not something that people see because they can't see it unless they're around me. I've noticed changes in myself, and many others have noticed changes as well in myself. My wife has. The comment section is filled with people who claim to see that I've changed in some manner. I'm more grounded. That's certainly true. And I'm generally embarrassed by how I conduct myself three months prior to any given time. So I look back at an interview that I've done two or three months ago, and I just cringe. I can't watch it. That, to me, indicates some level of change, implicitly. Now, Gina says... You mentioned in tow with Lou and Sean that you have an idea about the purpose of all of this, quote-unquote, similar to Christian love thine enemy, Jungian shadow integration, Buddhist loss of ego. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you arrived at that idea. And do you have a formalized practice practice for achieving this, this state of being? It's okay if it's too personal to share, she says. I I wouldn't say that it's too personal to share. I would say that it's just not formulated at a verbal level enough for me to share in a manner that doesn't misguide rather than guide or rather than actually state what I intend. The inarticulacy breeds the fear that what's shared will be misinterpreted. Stu N says, what is time? Is it a human construct from long ago that has just become more developed without evolution from the scratches on a cave to a nuclear clock? Or is it a fundamental force of the universe? I don't know. When it comes to time, I discussed that a bit with Gen Z, so I'll leave the link to that podcast in the description. I will be exploring time more on the podcast later this year. I know it's a controversial subject. At least it's a controversial subject to not treat it as obvious. However, we all have allodoxophobia. I just have to push through mine into this paradoxical and unsettled zone. Nevermind says, how happy are you from a scale of 1 to 100 with how things are going with the toe evolution? Can you share one thing you're not satisfied with and one thing you're extra proud of? So I would say I'm at 80 out of 100. And I'm just a covetous, selfish, rivalrous person. And the parts that I'm not terribly happy with tend to be parts where I feel like I'm underperforming relative to others or where I think I should be, but they generally are in comparison to others. There's this saying that you shouldn't compare yourself to others and you should compare yourself to yourself, but you have almost no idea of a conception of self without a conception of others. So I think that's a flawed statement. 
though there's obviously merit to it. So for example, I'm upset with myself for having a psychological issue or some, I don't want to call it a, I won't tiptoe around it, but regardless, whatever has cropped up a few months ago, four months ago or so. And that to me, I feel like has taken seven months. I imagine that it'll take me three more months to get back to normalcy. It's taken seven months of of my life, in a sense, from me. I'm upset with myself that I felt what I felt. I'm upset that I allowed myself to get in the condition where I could feel such dismay and horror. And that because of it for the past five months now, or four and a half months now, I've been functioning at a, about 30% my regular capacity. There's this, there's many studies done on sleeping, and they suggest that if you get less than seven hours of sleep for two nights in a row, it's like you're missing sleep for an entire 24 hours. Well, I haven't had a night's rest that's been more than six hours consistently for weeks and weeks and weeks. So I imagine that's having an extreme detrimental effect on my brain. And certainly my cognition, I can feel it. And certainly my stamina, I can feel that. So the parts that I'm thrilled, 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 thrilled about is the effects that Toe has had on people. It's Toe is essentially everything that I would ideally like to do outside of video editing. And, and luckily the patrons help me hire a, a freelancer and the parts that I, that I'm extremely, I can barely, I can't believe that I'm able to do this. And well, the, the parts that I love are the researching of physics and toes in general, theories of everything in general, that I can try to understand the universe and whatever that means and try to understand consciousness, quote unquote, whatever that means and free will and speak to the brightest minds of our time, be able to do so at home, which fits my umbratic nature and be able to work on my own schedule as well. It's as much a personal quest, like a transformational personal quest quest as it is about explicating to others. And this is all being done supported by people on Patreon. So I'm supported by people who like the mission and want to see, for example, I, I've been taking some time to study without placing out content for about a month. I'm able to do so because of Patreon. It's growing extremely quickly. I'm, I'm thrilled about that, especially for a podcast as, as specific as this one is. It's fairly technical. It generally requires that that you've watched many hours of this person on someone else's channel to get an introduction because I tend to not make it introductory like other larger podcasts. The content is narrow. It's narrowly focused about understanding reality rather than just interviewing people who are popular for the sake of interviewing people. So I'm, I'm, I, I'm extremely thrilled. I, I can't believe that I, I wake up excited about work almost every single day for the past two years. I, I'm, I'm thrilled with the majority of the aspects of it. Video editing, I don't like to do. Luckily, the patrons help with a freelancer who is graciously even editing this right now. So I get to focus on, on what I like to do, what I love to do. Mike Duffy says, what mic do you use? Thanks. So here's the mic. I'll show a video of that right now. And the reason why it's not great is because every time I shake my leg, it stutters it. And that's why often you'll hear, if you're listening carefully, you'll hear my audio shut off automatically until I come back on and speak. And that's because it's rumbling this mic. And every time I have the urge to urinate, my leg shakes dramatically. And every time I'm nervous, I shake my leg as well. So it's either nervousness or a urination urge. Dustin Gibson says, what tool are you using to record your writing? So what he's referring to is the crash course on physics. Again, that'll be listed somewhere along here. It's an iPad. I'm not a fan of Apple products. I don't, I don't use Apple in any other, for any other reason. It's just that they have an unparalleled note-taking app. And 
the screen refresh rate is 120 hertz, though I unwittingly bought the model that was 60 hertz. I didn't realize that the more expensive one was the one that was 120. I thought they all had 120. So I would much prefer if there was some Android tablet or a Windows one that had 120 hertz and a great note-taking app, but I'm using Apple in the interim. Tori Ko says, Kurt, I wanted to ask you, say that you've gotten quicker at processing and categorizing people's toes because of how many times that you've done it. Yes, that's generally true, Tori. And Tori says, I would assume that you have plenty of once firm but now violently shaken beliefs. Violently shaken is a great word. Yes, yes, yes. Throughout your life and experience of life. As an aside, an academic article or thesis of high caliber is akin to Ikea furniture, the assembling of Ikea furniture, where one constructs the manual, so that's the thesis statement, the overview, and then one places the screws in various slots and the products on the ground, and again, gaining an overview but of more delineated objects, specifically, and that's like the mise en place, if you were a chef, or the statement of the paragraphs in an academic thesis, and then Toward the end, it's all brought together where you arrange it cohesively and you present the final product. Now, the Toe Podcast or the Toe Channel, however one wants to conceptualize it, is much like that except without a manual, without knowing how many pieces there are, if what you have is even complete, and you don't know what it's going to look like finally. You're guided by some intuitions. You see bits and detritus and wreckage and you try to assemble it, and then you think you have a handle on it, but some new piece of information comes in and you realize that what you thought was a shelf is a bookcase, and then you realize you're missing some large blocks or this one doesn't fit, and you realize, oh, it's a refrigerator. So in a sense, you have some model, and you see that if this was to look like what I think it is, I would need a screw here and a screw here and a block here and so on. And that, in this, this analogy for a physics toe, that would be like the prediction of new particles and high energy physics where you see that there's some pattern except there are a few missing or it's like a missing cognitive piece for a Welt on Shaolin. But you search and search and you don't find it. So you have to recast what you think it is from scratch multiple times over, Tori Cole says. So in the midst of there being no firm ground to, ground to stand on, that's true. To the extent of to the extent of which you're familiar enough to label and categorize these shaken beliefs. What belief do you have that's not shaken enough to continue to pursue toe and to even wake up every morning? That there's a good worth striving for and that I love my wife and she's worth almost everything. And then my darkest thoughts about doubting the good and it's difficult to talk about without sounding well. Right, right. And then my, let's say my darkest thoughts that are debilitating, that come from a doubtful nature, can be themselves doubted. And that it's arrogance for me to feel so much suffering because I'm assuming with my body that whatever model or conceptualization I have is, is, is true. And the darkness was gotten to by doubting benevolence or certain aspects of reality so why not doubt the doubts apply them to themselves and that gives me some comfort along with praying which is strange to say as an agnostic because it's not like i have an an object to direct my prayers like an entity but i I pray for faith frequently. I I pray for for gratitude. I express gratitude. 
I'm not grateful to anywhere near the degree I, I should be or I could be. And the simple act of praying helps a great, 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 great deal. Mike Duffy says, for an AMA, can you do a quick overview of your podcast setup and what equipment you use? If you want, what I can do, Mike, is, and if anyone else is interested, I can do a, like I mentioned, I, I'm, I can do a separate video of simply what it takes to prepare for a tow podcast and go over my setup there. Fanny Ram says, how many hours a day does Kurt get to study? How many hours for a workout? So I used to work about 12 hours a day or so. Now I can do it for about four or five hours, though yesterday I I did maybe 14 or, or 15 hours. So it varies, but on average, it's about four or five now, given recent events. And working out is about 20 minutes to 30 minutes a day on average. Fanny also asks, Kurt seems so well studied, thank you, before an interview, sometimes without sleep, that's true. How come he doesn't get divorced? So it's because I prioritize time with my wife, Fanny. It's what keeps me sane. It's also what makes life worth it for myself. I used to think that all that matters is work. And I remember planning out a route to be a billionaire. Now, I don't even care about being a millionaire outside of the financial security that owning a million or two provides, clearly, such as being able to afford a home here in Toronto. Right now I'm, a rent I'm renting and pay for whatever my family needs, such as an emergency or to send my parents on a vacation or buy my, my in-laws a car in terms of bills and so on. Almost all I care about now is being a good husband. And that's that's been something that I've come to the conclusion of over the past couple months. It's the feeling that all will fade in some manner. And that whatever prideful importance I think I have, firstly, is it's far less than I imagine. And secondly, it's... Even if it's the same as my inflated ego wants to believe, then this is only a fleeting moment. If anything is worth anything, it has to stand the test of something akin to time. I don't say time because I don't believe that looking at some temporal duration is what matters. But it's something akin to time. And that there's an integral connection between doing what's temporary and what's sinful. I'm using plenty of religious language I I understand, I I see, and if you like, you can convert it to whatever secular version or synonym you would like to if you find that you're unable to conceive of yourself as anything other than a rational being. So then, if whatever this is, is only a, a moment, relatively speaking, then it would be worth every little bit if it's with my wife and if she feels adored and if I feel the same and that's priceless. There's, there's an infinite quality to that. An infinite quality to that. Whatever else I, I do may be misrepresented and taken from me, Diana Pasolka and I discussed this, that people take the Nirvana logo, kids do, and they have no idea what Nirvana music sounds like, or the good fortune in Sanskrit, Sanskrit becomes the Nazi symbol. So it's, it's as if what you do escapes you after you've done it. Additionally, whatever one does will get critiqued by those who are seeking status. I know I do this frequently, I'm extremely jealous, and we all are. I see it in myself. Thirdly, it will be forgotten in decades or centuries. It's rare that it would last longer than that. So what will be worth it in the end? Now, in the end, again, I'm using time there, and I don't mean to. It's just I don't know if we have the, the language. I think that it's all worth it in the end if it's about harmony and forgiveness and and mercy and love and generosity. And I can feel that most with my wife. I feel it and I practice it, and the more that I'm able to do it with 
with her, the more I'm able to do that broadly with others and feel it from others and even extend that to, say, homeless people on the streets who I never used to donate to. But now I have this intimation that the quality of a society is how we treat the homeless people in our society. And I mean that at a personal level, not a governmental level. Because as soon as you say, well, the government should take care of it, I think they should. But that doesn't mean that you don't or I don't have more, way, way more than enough to donate and help them and, and speak to them like they're, they're people that aren't just the receivers of your elemosinary nature so that you can feel like you're doing something good when it's it's to well, it's to scratch that charitable urge and it's it's not coming from the right place and you speak or at least I would have if I'm donating I would stand and give them the money I think it's better to to sit at their level their level even that has a patronizing bend to it but regardless to feel that kindness with my wife from my wife to my wife it also helps me retroactively change the past and that's extremely interesting because we talked about time so how does that work i think about the times that i've been hurt and there are plenty of times and i mainly think about the times that i've been hurt in relationships and so on and i'm able to recontextualize them as positive experiences. Now, Carl Pilkington once said that you don't know if you enjoyed a vacation until years later because you'll look back and you say, well, when I was swinging on that swing set, it started to rain and I had to duck for cover and I hated it at the time, but I look back on it fondly and I realize, quote unquote, that I indeed enjoyed it. It was fun. Ricky Gervais then interrupted and said, no, 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 you didn't have fun. You look back and think it's fun, but that's not the same thing. And I remember agreeing with Ricky, I no longer, I, I don't know if I do any, anymore. I don't know if it's the case that however you felt in the past is stamped down and it's fixed. I think that there's something about recontextualizing one's emotions about an event that somehow actually changed the event. And, well, it's it's strange to think like that, because then you have to have as a different basis something different than materialism or physicalism. You have to somehow take the emotions as primary, and there are philosophical strains that do so. For example, phenomenology. I don't know if if the experience of the initial emotion has some canonical status over one's experience now projecting onto the past. It's not clear to me at all. It's intuitively not clear, and I think we all feel this because we've had moments like this. Just because we feel it doesn't mean it's true, but it doesn't mean it's not true. I'm still thinking about it. So this means that going back to the original statement of me finding primary being a good husband or a good son or a good son of the good or a good son of the universe or what, whatever this means, that somehow this has to do with being kind and merciful and munificent and concerned and warm-hearted. It makes it not only worth it in the end, but it makes it worth it certainly in the present, but perhaps even in the past, which means it makes it eternally worth it. Wittgenstein had a quote about this, by the way. He said that if if we were to take eternity not to mean infinite temporal duration, but timelessness, then an eternal life belongs or belong to those who live in the present. I think he may be correct. Though it takes an extreme amount of courage to live in the present, at least for myself. It's not, it's, it's no trivially, just no trifling, trivial matter. It's extremely formidable. I think he's correct, though I don't, I think that the mechanism may apply to the future and to the past as well. Okay, Joseph PTS wants to know, would you consider having Eric back on to specifically discuss the physics of geometric unity? Yes, when I have the time to make a video about how to go through a physics paper that one currently doesn't understand. So I referenced that in the crash course on physics. And I would like to tell you all about the schedule, but 
I, I don't have much time left here. This has already taken so much more than I thought, and I'm only about a quarter of the way done. I thought I'd be half done or more. The point of the Toe podcast is for it to lead somewhere. It's not simply interviewing people for the sake of speaking to people that I'm interested in, like Rogan or Lex or uh, Russell Brand, though they're great, great, great podcasts, and I'm I'm not diminishing them in the least. That's just not what Toe is. Toe is Toe has a goal. There's a trajectory that's trying to be hit with virtually every episode. It's about explicating toes and learning them deeply. Agent Nan says. Theories like math and physics like symmetry, but the universe seems to be asymmetric. Handedness, chirality, time, entropy, matter, anti-dark, why though? Are there any insights from theory or experiment? Can there be? There are, there are elementary results in mathematics that imply that, at least to myself, that certain physics problems aren't problems. So, for example, the hierarchy problem, I don't see it as being an issue, the fact that gravity is quote-unquote, more weak than, and drastically more so than the the strong force, the weak force, and so on. Because you can have symmetry in a certain respect and then break it with another. There's a Frobenius theorem about that. I can go into that in another, in another podcast if someone's interested. And then there are also, there are also problems where you have a symmetry in the initial conditions, and even a, a seeming symmetry in the problem that can lead to an asymmetric solution. So, for example, let's say you have an equilateral triangle. So you think, well, what's more symmetric than an equilateral triangle? And then I say, well, how do you populate that with three spheres such that you maximize the total area of those spheres? So the, what's, sorry, spheres as in circles, I mean. So you place a circle into an equilateral triangle and you can make it larger. And then you place another one, but you're not allowed to overlap. And then you think, well, the solution should look symmetric because the initial conditions are symmetric. A circle is certainly symmetric. The way that the problem is stated doesn't seem to have any asymmetry involved. However, the solution looks like an equilateral triangle with the circle toward the top. I'll see if I can put an image. And then two circles at the bottom. It's an asymmetric solution. So it's not clear to me that what's required is always symmetry breaking. It could just be that a symmetrically posed problem can have an asymmetric solution. Ghost, I love your podcast, but you don't ever seem to believe. If you had the opportunity to see something paranormal, would you take it? I would say that I'm undecided right now, but I'm curious, and I wouldn't say that that's that I disbelieve. I don't think that's the same as being in a state of disbelief or disbelieving, and the answer just is no, not right now. Pan Kaj. Ten Nija says, has anyone studied the properties of matter, motion, by imagining all moments of the past and the present concurrently, extra-dimensional view, question mark, where it appears as a wave of solid colors in a time-lapse image, seems like it would have a wave property. Well, okay, I'm, I'm unclear as to, I'm sorry, Pancash, I'm unclear as to what the question is, is stating, though if what you want is the past and the present and so on and so on. Concurrently, the block universe is something you can look up. Will the electrin, electrician says, now that you've talked with Pius, Salvatore Pius, I'll leave a thumbnail here if you're interested. And he said that essentially next level physics is only possible with plasma. Would you be willing to do a deep dive on plasma in particular with an interview with Montgomery Childs of the Sapphire Project? I will be talking to someone from the Sapphire Project at some point. I contacted them, and that was around the time when I spoke to Ross Coulthart. And whenever they're ready for the announcement of something new, they'll come onto the Toe podcast. That's what they said. Olivier Gothels says, Dear Kurt, I love your honest intent and the expressed content of your channel. My bold question. Are you able and willing to invite Jordan Peterson and Bernardo Castro up for a series of talks on your channel? I will say, Olivier, perhaps in 2024. There are plenty of plans for the Toe channel in the latter half of 2022 and, and certainly in 2023. 
plenty that's exciting. Hocha says, any chance with Jordan Peterson on your podcast and so on? Well, he interest, he interviewed me, interestingly enough. I didn't interview him, but I'll leave a link to that, again, somewhere here and in the description. Alvaro says, will Christopher Koch be on the show someday? Yes. Abnormal Archive says, when is Nima Arkani Hamed coming on? I'm working on it. Rakuda Mela says, Kurt, I was thinking that you could try to get in touch with Lee Smolin and Carlo Rovelli for your next interviews. Is this feasible? Carlo's done already. Lee is someone I would like to do, but his health isn't the best currently. Skim Sen says, would you consider facilitating a debate between Steven Pinker and Bernardo Castrop regarding rationality and intuition? So I'm working on that. I, there's plenty to announce. Ron Devis says, Kurt, have you ever experienced personally CE5? No, I I don't. I haven't, and I, I would not like to, at least not right now. John Doe says, have you asked... Well, John Doe says, have you asked Paul Stamets to join you on a show? He's one of my favorite people, along with Shulgin, Alexander Shulgin. We'll see, Paul. I mean, sorry, we'll see, John. Michael Manley says, Kurt, are you familiar with the work of David Bentley Hart, particularly his works on the experience of God being consciousness and bliss? I emailed David a few years ago, and he said, yes, he would like to come on the podcast. I don't think it was named Toe back then. That's how long ago it was. I emailed David when the podcast was in its infancy, and he responded positively. I haven't had the opportunity to peruse his oeuvre, let's say, yet, though I would like to. When I emailed him, I don't even think the podcast was called Toe. That's how, that's how long ago it was. T. Sol X says, Kurt, what are your thoughts on Nassim Haramin's theory from the Resonance Foundation? Any chance he would be a guest? So I have heard of him many times. I need to look into his work. It will take me many months, and likely by the end of the year, I'll be able to bundle him with several other guests like Clee Irwin. I'll see if I can get to the schedule for the Toe podcast later in this AMA. By the way, I I released the schedule on the on the Patreon if you're interested. Electric Wheel says, can you get Bob Lazar on the podcast? We will see, Electric Wheels. By the way, notice that this is an entirely eclectic mix, the people that were mentioned previously in the let's say the past three minutes or four minutes. Some people think it's strange to have Chomsky on the same channel as X or or Leo Gura with Stuart Hameroff or aliens mixing with the Fields medalists like Richard Borchards. I, it may seem strange, but there may be a convergence. And I don't know how to find such a convergence unless I'm guided by my supra-consciousness, so I wouldn't even say subconsciousness. It's something like my intuition. And it seems strange when Jung was studying God and consciousness and psychology. Those don't belong together. When Leonardo da Vinci was combining and studying anatomy with engineering with art. And Newton by studying alchemy and the Bible and physics. Yet Newton's views on there being universal laws were precipitated directly by the by his understanding of the omnipotence and the omniscience of God. So, it may seem bizarre that there's such a avant-garde mix, but there's a possible point of novel and practical confluence that I'm uncertain of how to get to unless I am able to unearth and explore extensively and investigate with the instincts that I have. So the Toll podcast is it's strange. It's not a podcast. I mean, it's it seems like a podcast, but I just don't know what else to call it. It's as if, the way that I feel, it's as if it's in the 1900s and one was doing just film. In the midst of people doing 60 minute long and 90 minute long films, someone started putting out 30 minute long films and they had storylines that connected when usually films are singular and self-contained. And then you would think, well, that's not how film is done. What the heck is going on with this? and then it gets critiqued and evaluated as film, but you realize only decades and decades later what the person was trying to do was develop 
television in the early days of film. But they didn't have the vocabulary to call it television. They didn't know what they were doing. They were guided by something. And they they were in a society with the prevalence of film. And because of its resemblance to film, it gets collocated with film and evaluated with the same rubric as film when when the rubric by which it should be evaluated hasn't been invented. And the filmmaker themselves didn't know what they were doing. So that's what I imagine Toe is like. I keep reiterating that Toe is not a podcast in so much as it's a project. The Toe Project is what I say frequently. And that's just because that's the best word that I have for it. The podcast is the closest form, but I'm unsure if that's if that's what Toe is. Toe is, you can think of it as groping in the dark and trying to understand some object before light shines on it. By the way, there's maybe some meaningful relationship between the physical act of looking and existence in and of itself. That sounds strange because we have a society that is based in materialism. But the first step, at least for the intuitive types like myself, is to flounder around in the Stygian gloom and then hope that something positive occurs or that some light is illuminated and something is felt and some model is made. There's the Mars rovers, by the way, which I love the names of because I feel like that's what the the Toe channel or the Toe project is trying to do is follow them. It's to follow, quote unquote, my curiosity, hopefully guided by my spirit and to see what opportunities are afforded to me at the time. U-N-H-R-E-M-N-A asks, what is a theolocution? Okay, so let's see. I wrote this down. You can think of a theolocution as an advancement of knowledge rather than a destruction, which is generally the style of debates. And that a theolocution is couched in tenderness and respect. So Socrates used questions and answers to generate new knowledge. That's called the Socratic method. Though he did so privately, and if it was in public, the, the point of it wasn't to do it publicly. And he also did it sardonically. Now contrasting this, the way that I like to think about the what a theolocution is, is the Socratic method plus an audience plus fondness. So that equals a theolocution if you want to think of it as a equation. So your ancestors, Danny says, are from India. Indeed, I am from Toronto. I was born in Trinidad. My parents are from Trinidad. My ancestors, say the great, great Great-grandparents are from the West Indies. Ryan says, Ah, shucks. Missed the AMA. How can we know how to enter an AMA and when they come up? Whether this is my AMA or an AMA with, let's say, Pius, Salvatore Pius, and so on. So I announce all of what I plan on doing, generally, far in advance on Patreon. And I give an indication as to the direction for the next few months regularly. This is in contrast to a call for questions, which which are generally done openly on the YouTube page. So if you want, you can sign up for the Patreon. Just so you know, the Patreon is the virtually the only way that I'm able to do this the other ways with the sponsors. So I'm super, super grateful for the sponsors and for and for the patrons, people who donate out of the kindness, generosity of their own heart when they have when there's no obligation to do so. It's incentive free. There is one tier. So when I say it's incentive free, that is to say you don't get any special invites on Patreon. You don't get any special access on Patreon. There is one tier though, a Metafield Theorist tier, which just opened up about a month ago, where you can speak to myself for about an hour or so, along with others who are on the group call. It's limited to about six people. And people seem to have enjoyed it for the previous one for an additional benefit that I didn't foresee, which is networking. Someone recently wanted some metal printing done and someone else there was in that field and someone wanted help getting his toe more known. And someone said that they knew how to pair Silicon Valley investors up with people who are interested in having their toe or sorry, having some personal intellectual endeavor conducted. There's someone who I think about Every once in a while, his name is Voltaire. I don't think I've ever mentioned him on the podcast. And Voltaire had a phrase where he said that he has made himself de- he's made himself dependent in order to become independent. 
And I feel like that's a great way of summarizing what Patreon is. The reason I'm mentioning it here is because many people who are on the who are patrons have said they would never have known about it had I not mentioned it. And I remember saying, I mentioned in virtually every episode, they said, oh, I just, I've listened to you for a year and I haven't heard it until just yesterday. Well, that's because many people skip the intros. So I'm, I'm deeply grateful. I view it like busking. It's a shameful plug. You know, people say I, this is a shameless plug and so on. I, I feel some shame. It's embarrassing though. I tend to view it like busking where the podcast is be is able to be enjoyed entirely for free like a musical performance or a magic trick except it's a podcast in this case and then you choose to pay in fact it's even more anonymous than busking because you don't have the added social pressure of people around you and then the end where everyone claps and you have to awkwardly walk away there's no obligation even here this comes with a timestamp somewhere where you can skip this whole spiel because I feel like the, firstly, I don't like to be talked to in this manner when it comes to someone advertising the ways to support them or sponsors and so on. And all of these come with a timestamp somewhere here or here where they say you can skip this introduction or sponsor message because, well, I don't want to force or trick anyone into listening to what they didn't intend to listen to. And what that does is it radically reduces the amount that a sponsor is willing to pay and the amount that people would sign up to Patreon because, like I mentioned, someone has watched for a year and then had no idea that I even had a Patreon. But I feel like in the long run, the trust that's engendered by putting up a timestamp or a method for you to click out of this such that you don't feel manipulated into listening to something you didn't want to, that that will lead to a better relationship with with you, with the people who are watching, with the patrons, and with the sponsors. So in the short run, it's not it's not terribly great monetarily, but hopefully in the long run, it is. And my wife, my wife is extremely grateful for all the support. She is more grateful in many ways than I am, and that's saying plenty. So if you're supporting or not just by watching, thank you. I I appreciate your eyes. I appreciate whatever. It's it's. I'm in an extremely blessed position, so thank you. As for the sponsor, today's sponsor is Brilliant, and Brilliant, like I mentioned before, Brilliant is a place that you can go to to view interactive learning experiences on statistics and mathematics and physics. You can learn about group theory. You can learn about entropy. I, over the winter break, the 2021, December 2022, January, was studying about entropy because I wanted to learn why is it that the formula for entropy is written in this manner and it becomes extremely clear, extremely lucid and perspicuous why S equals lawn or log of the amount of states is an extremely natural way of categorizing the information held in a system and that it would be strange to define it in any other manner. That comes from brilliant that my knowledge of that comes from brilliant and that's going to help me when i eventually get to speak to chiara marletto or david deutsch on their constructor theory so visit brilliant.org to to get 20 percent off your annual subscription moses patunikos says do you prefer burger king to kentucky i i i much prefer burger king i actually well it's just that kentucky fried chicken is a bit too expensive for my taste dustin Hutchinson says, if you were me, what question would you ask? Well, I think I would ask that question, Dustin. And that perhaps keeps in the theme of your image of the picture of a snake eating itself. Jim Morrison says, how do you have under 5,000 Twitter followers, but over 100,000 YouTube subscribers. Can you make it less obvious that you've purchased subscribers? So none of Twitter followers were purchased. None of the YouTube subscribers were purchased. I don't, I just don't tweet. So, or if I do, it's primarily requests for information or promotion for toe. I'm not terribly interesting on Twitter. If you want to follow with that ringing endorsement, then it's at toe with Kurt. And you can also see that there's someone like Arvin Ash, who has, I think, s over 600,000 subscribers and then less than on YouTube and then less than 10,000 on Twitter. 
Grant Sanderson has millions and millions of YouTube subscribers, but far less, a tenth less on Twitter. This is just par for the course. If your main bread and butter is YouTube, I, I don't imagine why your Twitter should be anywhere comparable. A.H. and many others have thought have asked, what are your thoughts on extra dimensions? So I'm interested in, in, in how much of the fuss in physics is about higher dimensions and then compactifying it, reducing it to the four that we see in order to explain observations. I think it's much more interesting to start with a lower dimensional space and then build up to a four-dimensional space. Holography is one method, by the way, because you have at least one dimension down at a boundary. And notice I said that I find it interesting, and interesting is not a synonym for, for correctness. It's just a subjective guide that occasionally leads you to a place of importance once explored rigorously, and then seeing if it has any connections to what we eventually think of as a correct path. That's physics and math, or pure math in a nutshell. One explores purely out of interest, and then hopefully later, some future mathematician or future physicist will find use in it. This happens so often that it's difficult to find exceptions to it. Rock Thompson says, with regard to your conversation with Lewis Alessandro, do you think it's more of what he has seen and not able to speak fully open about it? So, Rock, I don't understand the question, unfortunately, and I I do think he's seen plenty that he can't talk about if that's what you're referring to. I tactician HD. I'm genuinely curious why it's why UAPs accelerate so fast and why it's not followed by a sonic boom. So I don't know as well. That's one of the mysteries. It may be a manipulation of space-time or plasma or some other atypical effect. I'm unsure. Alexandra Gagne says, Art Vandalay, he's an architect, right? Now that's a reference to when I say, or when I have said, type in Art Vandalay in the beginning of one of the episodes, and it's a Seinfeld reference. Scott Hernandez says, Kurt, I'm wondering, I hope you're not offended by this question. Are you on the spectrum? And and you strike me as someone who might be. I am glad to see your show is doing well. I wish you success. So technically, Scott, everyone is on the spectrum, though I'm not diagnosed with even a scintilla of Asperger's or autism or whatever is close to that. I do have ADHD to an unbelievable degree. That's certainly true. If my style of speech or delivery is staccato, it's generally because I tend to think extremely carefully about what I'm saying, and I try to match what I'm saying with what's intended, and I try to say it in a new manner, at least frequently, and I try to not repeat what other people have said, and I try to determine if what I'm saying is someone else's speech or someone else's thoughts rather than my own. So it's it's an extremely difficult process to, to extemporize. And also keep in mind that I'm severely nervous when doing podcasts. Don't mistake the uneasiness and stage fright for someone being on the spectrum. Stephen Paul King says, do you have any any thoughts on constructor theory? Not yet. Means of savagery. Kurt, have you ever considered getting help with your editing? Well, plenty of people have said that they would do it for free, but then they don't. And plenty of people said, yeah, Kurt, I'll help you with transcribing for free, but then they don't. Often volunteers aren't the most reliable source. Right now, I'm lucky enough to be able to afford someone who can do at least the preliminary edit, and that's due to the patrons, like I mentioned before. It's extremely tricky to get help with the channel in other domains, because what I'm doing is, it's not something that's been attempted before, and it's not something that I can state in an unblurred manner, like in a limpid manner. So for example, there's a tome manual. Sorry, there's a, yes, that's right, there's a tome coming up. A manual of all the toes. And I I can't imagine someone helping me with that. It's extremely difficult because toe is a personal quest, like I mentioned. Distilling it down to what I think is a proper form for someone to be able to understand a particular toe. Each toe, let's say, has a page long dedicated to it. That's 
not simple and what someone else thinks is obvious may not be obvious to me. And what I think is is clear that it should be included as an ingredient in such a page may not be clear to someone else. There's too much back and forth. There's another project that there are two other projects that I have that I are about integrating physics and consciousness and even UFOs, but I can't announce that currently. Left blank says, I wanted to ask if you've taken any psychedelics and would you consider DMT? I would definitely not take any DMT any time in the near or medium future. Raw Dog says, I watched There Will Be Blood for the first time because you mentioned it. It's a great film. What did you like about it? I like the cinematography. I have a particularly keen eye for shot composition and a particular taste when it comes to that. For example, I like long, drawn-out shots that are meticulously planned. I like that there was zero of a plot line regarding love or some romantic interest. And that's extremely, extremely rare. You'll notice that. Virtually every movie has a romantic interest subline, subplot. I also like the grittiness, the seriousness. I like films that are different in some major manner. I like the writing as well. I have a keen ear for dialogue that's quote-unquote lame or cringeworthy or artificial. It stands out to me in the same way that a, a glitch may stand out to someone who plays a video game. And I've heard many video game reviewers say they don't like the glitches in, let's say, Fallout or some of the Bethesda titles because it breaks, quote-unquote, breaks the illusion of the game. I don't personally get absorbed in video games like that enough for it to break because I always feel like I'm, I know that I'm playing a game. It's obvious to me if there's a glitch. Well, that's just par for the course of a video game. However, when there's feeble dialogue in a movie... I can't help but notice that. I notice it like this. It just stands out to me just as much as I imagine a glitch in a video game stands out to the people who feel like they're absorbed in the video game. Easter Beast says, is there an email address where I can ask a question about something I experienced? Please, please, Easter Beast, please know. I, firstly, I don't, I, I don't know if I can handle hearing about other people's experiences. Secondly, I don't want to be in the possession of special knowledge that I can't share. I'm not interested in classified information. I don't want to be in a position where I can't speak with candor or I may need to be I may need to compromise by speaking expediently or dissimulating and I can't handle to be quite frank. I can't handle when people are discanting at length to me about what they've gone through or their advice for me and I just use the word frank so Frank Yang has done something similar. And Frank, by the way, I am sorry. Frank, I'm sorry. I know you've sent me a quite lengthy email response. I'm not healthy enough right now to look at it without being provoked and triggered. I'm slowly getting there, slowly, slowly getting there. Thank the heavens. Thank the Lord. Thank, well, thank you. I I appreciate the effusive response, Frank and others. And I apologize that I'm not able to respond more quickly. Many people have sent words of encouragement and instruction, and often they're contingent on some worldview that's metaphysical or or, the, or from people who consider themselves to be enlightened, self-titled as enlightened, and I, I hope you, you forgive me that I haven't responded to you. I'm just not at the place where I can begin to read those comments. And personally, I don't understand how someone can study physics or, or let's see let's say metaphysics and consciousness and ufos and what it means to have an identity and the self and so on and not go through totalizing horror to me it just means that they haven't thought deeply enough about it or that they haven't thought severely enough about it or genuinely enough about it or intensely enough about it i feel like if one hasn't found a truth that they haven't recoiled from in horror then perhaps one hasn't searched enough. One has almost no clue, almost no clue as to how much this path that one is on has been trodden by millions and millions and trillions, billions of people, entities, objects before you, and they aid you in your healthy pursuit of some 
hypothetical claim and you think, well, hey, I'm just, I'm truly contending with this. I don't think you are. I don't, I don't think I was until I, well, I'm speaking so vaguely around this because it's, it's difficult to, but I think that if one hasn't shuddered and thought that, oh my gosh, this can't be, no, 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 then one thinks that they're, or that one is deluding themselves into thinking they're rolling in the deep, but they're merely an ant on the surface. I'm speaking again from personal experience, thinking that what I was doing was intense investigations into reality, but I was just performing negligible scratches on the surface. Our MT, or MT, says, I'm late to the party, but I hope you read this. Kurt, have you watched pro wrestling? No. I've seen images, videos, and so on, but I don't watch it. I, I'm not interested in that. It sounds interesting, though. I, I think you like it, and I'm glad that you do. Marky the Sparky says, Really enjoying the podcast. Just one question. Why do we assume UFOs are from outer space? That's correct, Marky. One should perhaps not assume that. Craig Fleming says, Get him on your show, Stephen Greer. Lab Rat Pam says, Have you thought about Stephen Greer as a guest? Silver Platter says, What's your take on Stephen Greer? And ZZ Co says, Hi, Kurt. Thanks for your work. What are your thoughts on Stephen Greer? So, I have emailed Stephen and Stephen's people, particularly this one lady named Anna Kramer, who serves as his assistant. I've emailed her approximately once a month for the past year or year and a half or so, and she has said every single time, no, Stephen will not come on. I I don't know why, because I haven't had someone say no so consistently ever for any interview that I've done, whether it's with my previous company, Indie Film TO, or as a, as a filmmaker in some other film, or Toe, or or any other, any other venture in my life. I don't think I've had someone say no so many times without saying yes. The public email for Anna is Anna Kramer at SeriousDisclosure.com. I will put that in the email address. The reason why, sorry, I'll put that in the description. The reason why I'm saying that al- aloud is because it's a public email. And I think that if you who's listening would request, I would love to see Stephen Greer on the Toe podcast, on the Theories of Everything podcast with Kurt. Can you please have him come on? I would love to see that. If you email and say that, that would increase the chances. Shore Basher says, in biblical times, they said that angels came from the heavens of on chariots of fire. Do you think that UFOs could be angels or the workings of God? I think that the apologue, that the current phenomenon, served as an inspiration for ancient hierophany is not terribly strong. I know many people love that proposition or that hypothesis. I'm not terribly convinced. It's tied to religion in the form of of being a scaffolding or an instigation of all of religion or all of major religion to me is it's contradictory and it can't be the full account. It could possibly be a partial account. Rajiro Bahiro says, Good evening, Kurt. Concerning UFOs, are you now a believer after all the interviews you've done? Are you still a skeptic? Are you a skeptic? And why? And, and so on. Thanks from Canada. Cool. I'm an inquisitor. I'm unsure what is occurring. It feels like something is amiss. I don't see it as being obviously terrene or non terrene and I am certainly not a skeptic. I'm a curious person. Dean Colby says, what are your three favorite novels? I I don't have more than one favorite book, and that's Gertel Escher Bach. I don't think I have a second. I do have two books that I frequently and only recommend on this channel. I think there's only been two books by people who are living Sorry, by people who have been on the Toe channel. That's Carlo Rovelli's The Order of Time, I believe it's called. And then another is Ian McGilchrist's Master and His Emissary. I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed those books. I also love Gerdel Escherbach. 
Douglas Hofstetter hasn't been on the program, so I don't include him in that, but I recommend that wholeheartedly. Matthew Wallace says, hello, Kurt, how do you avoid existential dread? Barely, Matthew, though I'm I'm thinking of doing a standalone podcast on the dark night of the soul, much like how I read Jacob Smullyan's God is a Taoist, which is one of my favorite pieces on this channel. It's the musings of a mathematician on free will. From a Zen perspective, couched in the chronicle of a man speaking to God, begging God to release him from the burden of free will. Just me thinking about doing a reading of the Dark Knight of a Soul, sorry, the Dark Knight of the Soul, and doing some commentary on it, it provokes me slightly, it agitates me, and I think that that may be a reason why I should do it as a form of therapy for myself, and perhaps, hopefully others. It may quell my own existential dread, recontextualize it to not be so terrifying and debilitating. I've also talked about the Dark Knight of the Soul on the Diana Pasolka podcast, which will be around here, and the Chloe Valdery podcast. In some ways, it's about ego death, though perhaps the term ego death should be ego transformation or liberation or metamorphism or integration, because it can feel like dying, but I don't think ego death is the right term. I think it's a, well, it's a provocative term. There's light, though. There's wonderful beams of light, of a wonderful, wondrous, beneficent, beatific place of of goodness that can come from it, a, a, a place that's, that's helpful and, and supporting and shielding and generous. and tranquil, and calming, and loving. So I don't know if ego death is the right term. I would prefer to have a different terminology. I feel like my issue with with toe, what's happened is that I've been hypothesizing and hypostatizing far too much. It's it's a huge, huge, huge cognitive effort. Sorry, it's a huge imposition in some ways to go through someone's toe and then jump to another one and then jump to another one and jump to another one. It's extremely psychologically unsettling. Like that's to say the least, it's unsettling. It's something that I, thinking about toes and thinking about how to make sense of certain facts and not even facts, how to make sense of what it means to make sense is something that consumes me unceasingly virtually every single minute of every waking day for the past few months. And by the way, sometimes even the sleeping days, that, that is to say, not just in my wakeful moments, but when I sleep, though I love it. I don't, I actually like nightmares. I rarely get them, but I I have a perverse relationship to nightmares because I believe that they're regenerative in some manner that I'm facing a fear. And hey, I would much rather face it there than face it in in, a, in the waking life. I used to believe that people who say you should be open-minded, but not so open-minded that your head falls out. I used to feel like they betray a certain idea of God because what they're doing is following, not following truth. They're following what it means to survive and to put their health above objective truth or something higher than themselves that is to say how do you know you crossed a line until you've crossed it even even then you don't know because many people who have gone mad quote unquote don't believe themselves to be mad and it's difficult to know when one's head has fallen out but i see the utility in that phrase and i never saw it before i used to see that as being a statement that's less about searching for the truth and more about justifying the perimeter of lines that you've already established shouldn't be crossed. So it's a statement of anti-truth. But now I see that there's, there's, ex there, well, there's extreme danger. And what it feels like to awaken, if that's even what it, what is the case is it's, it's like a, at least now it feels like I'm in a daze. I'm in, I'm, in, I'm, I'm sleeping while I'm awake. 
It's, it's at least not horrific anymore. There are moments of lucidity which happen more and more and more frequently. Thank. Thank God. Thank the universe. Thank whatever it may be. I feel much more grounded. I feel more egoly. Sorry, my ego feels more grounded. And it's extremely pleasant. And now I've come to the conclusion that perhaps one shouldn't have an open mind necessarily. One should have an open heart. But that's not the same as an open mind. And an open heart comes first. I don't think that the terror is worth the trade. I think that love should be primary. And I hope that... I hope that... Well... Well, I hope. I hope. What I hope for. I don't know. Ja James Robert Ryan says, Kurt, you're far too hard on yourself. Please stop. You're a beautiful human soul. Mobsta Imaging says, I have yet to catch the full episode with Diana, yet I can see that you're struggling and I would suggest that you don't be too hard on yourself. Your insane attempt to try and comprehend everything in the way that you do by going into minutia and mathematics and physics and so on is, is putting yourself under constant stress of, of sitting in endless exams where you're cramming for studying without break. Mobsta imaging, I used to be extremely hard on myself. I still am in many respects, but I've slowly come to appreciate that what I'm, or what is being done with the Toe Channel is a, is a, is a, well, firstly, I've forgotten almost all of my university studies, which means I'm starting from scratch. So I've had to build up essentially a PhD level understanding of different fields. When I say it, it's almost like it is because technically as a PhD and a postdoc, you have to do research. So it's an unqualified statement when I say that it's at the PhD level. Hopefully that makes sense. But I've come to now appreciate that this is an extremely difficult endeavor because of that reason. And, and I have to do so while I'm not at my cognitive optimal, firstly, age-wise. Secondly, I'm, well, recent events wise and i'm studying completely alone having almost no one to ask for clarification here and there and then number four i'm building the theories of everything channel in different directions simultaneously emailing guests and so on booking and editing and number five i'm i'm studying much more than mathematics and physics i'm studying neuroscience and philosophy and religion and metaphysics and i have to do this all while still being able to spend time with my wife and while being able to keep my body extremely fit, which I prioritize my health and, and my relationship, and while being interviewed on other platforms like previously just about two hours or three hours ago, I was on Greg Henriques and Generation Z a few hours prior to that and Chris Leto was coming up, Coleman Hughes is coming up, and I have to do that while not knowing what the heck am I doing. I'm learning all of this as I go. There's no straight and narrow list of courses in order to to get a degree in the subject of toes and at the same time I'm doing that while I have a nonprofit film company on the side running a film festival and then at the same time I'm doing that while not having someone to carry me like Eric Weinstein did for Lex or or Rogan did for Lex or to have personal connections to people like Hal Putoff like I know some YouTubers do and they say, yeah, I'm friends with him, and I've talked with him. So I have some bitterness and self-loathing there. I I do, I see it. I I just remind myself, look, Kurt, you're doing all of this, all of what I've listed simultaneously, virtually by myself. And luckily now I have the help of my wife, who essentially, who's, who's like a partner in tow, and she... She does. She helps me with the comments and with the direction of Toe. And now I'm luckily able to hire an editor for Toe. So I have to remind myself that it's an extremely heavy, 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 heavy load. I still feel, if I'm being honest, that I am not making enough progress. I'm extremely far behind. I often feel, I often tell myself I'm 15 years behind. I feel like my mind is 15 years too late. 15 years over and over that I'm not learning quick enough. I'm, I get extremely annoyed when I have to relearn material that I should have absorbed the first time 15 years ago. But at the same time, it's, it's, it's just... 
it's it's not something that's been attempted at least not publicly i don't i don't know so i can give myself some slack it's difficult though because i feel like when i'm i it's difficult for me to pat myself on the back i feel like i'm giving myself a way out so self love is something that i have a a difficult time with i'm getting much better with that though i'm i'm much better with that than i've ever been i'm nowhere near optimal Andreas Muller says, a German here, firstly, your pronunciation of Weltanschauung is terrible and cute. Secondly, why is it so important for you to find a Weltanschauung? What I admire about you is that you remain critical and open. But after so many guests all lying to themselves, surely you have realized that the quest is pointless. Even if you disagree, what would the consequence be if you agreed with me? So firstly, let's spell out what a Weltanschauung is. That's like an an all-encompassing worldview such that you can contextualize or interpolate novel pieces of, in- of information. You can acquire new knowledge quickly because you have a model that's already been formed. And this view usually has something to do with ontology, which is metaphysics. And and then you live in a way that that comports with that. So some people, they live in a way that's, that's self, sorry, that's hypocritical. But I consider someone who has a Weltanschauung to be consistent with their professed beliefs. And the model generally has a, a built-in mechanism for updating its own model. So that's a, a meta model. All lying to themselves really realize that the quest is pointless. Hmm. So there's some... I have intimations occasionally of a twin Wittgenstein, who's a philosopher of the 1900s, and Heidegger, who's also a philosopher of the 1900s, continental and analytical, that... I have intimations that there is no point to talking, that this is all fruit, fruitless and futile, and language is a, is a problem. So some people would take the approach and say, okay, so then let's stop talking. But Heidegger takes the approach and says that it means that we need to develop a new language. The current language is the problem, much like if one was trying to do mathematics without algebra which was the case thousands of years ago, you're severely limited in what you could do. Essentially, you could just do Euclidean geometry and not even topology. So topology is geometric, but you need open sets. So you need to have an algebraic conception to understand topology properly. And otherwise you can just do so purely visually, but then you miss certain aspects of topology. You can't do physics precisely either. So imagine you go back 3000 years ago and you say that language is the problem and only experience can tell you the laws of physics but then you would completely miss that experience is extremely misleading when it comes to seeing regularities of nature and laws and so on there are plenty of counterintuitive results and that's leaving quantum mechanics out of this it seems extremely clear that there are entire frameworks and worldviews and and models that that are in principle out of reach from one's current position However, acquiring some new psychotechnology, quote unquote, allows for some radical change. And this is a term from John Verveke. A way to think about this is imagine if, imagine all of the concepts you can't, you can't have, let alone explain, if all that was taken from you were, well, if every single word was taken from you except 10. So you could only express 10 words. Then would you say, well, these concepts are in principle out of reach? Maybe. You would say so, but it would be false because it just requires an explication of language, a delineation of language, a more specific language. So then you can think of that in an interesting manner. What the heck is the TOW project? Well, it's an attempt to build psychotechnologies. There's that word again, psychotechnologies, to bridge the gap between the East and the West, which currently is currently seems unbridgeable, according to many people. And perhaps even some orthogonal view, it's not just east and west, perhaps there's a third, perhaps there's a fourth. So an attempt to bridge some communication between them to merge them, abigenosis, I call this occasionally, such that we can hopefully understand the the world. This is tricky to say because there are many assumptions that go in this, but let me just speak around this, such that we can understand the world and ourselves Better is the word that comes to mind, but it's false. It's not better. Accurate it may not even be the correct word here. But hopefully you understand what I'm trying to convey. Sebastian Mahler says, 
How do you have such white teeth? Tips. Beautiful looking hair as well. I also like the frowning look. Pretty good podcast also. Good day. Well, hey, man. Sebastian, thank you. Chase says, do you know the subset scores of your IQ? Verbal versus non-IQ. I believe I talked about IQ on the first podcast. As for the subset, the verbal, I believe, was far lower than the analytical or the mathematical component. Mark Irardo says, what brand or model of the guitar is there behind the wall? It's just a simple Epiphone, I believe it's called. And I get questions about this guitar. People want to hear me play. I sing and play. I wouldn't imagine it's terribly great. I sing mainly 90 songs. I I would love to record a cover song or two, but my wife is adamantly against it because she feels probably accurately so that I'll embarrass myself. And it's also self-aggrandizing. At least it would be in my case. If you want to see another side of me, an artistic side, though this one is on the comedic end, then perhaps watch the April Fool's video, particularly number two, which is here, the the ranking of the toes, that's what it's called. And I do st- essentially stand up there, because I used to do stand up when I was younger. Charles Gervais says, hey, Kurt, what's the best way to stay up to date with the latest articles within one's desired field? What are the best journals and so on? That's Ch- Charles, that's extremely field dependent. I don't know much out of a narrow focus of high energy physics. And even there, I know almost, I'd say almost nothing. There's several subfields. You can be at the top of string theory and know virtually nothing about the developments in your closest competitor, loop quantum gravity. And this was evidence when David Gross spoke to Carla Ravelli. Philip O says, did you say that you want to interview Les Stroud someday? Or did I dream that? Ha, that would be an epic crossover. I'm a huge fan of him since I was a child. I did an interview, Philip, with Les, and I'll put the link in the description. I'll also put a thumbnail here. Chase says, Kurt, have you considered your inability to leave your mind and attend to the things around you? That is less of a left brain issue and perhaps an issue to be fleshed out in in therapy and psychoanalysis. Do you reckon this is just your nature? I am able to leave my mind now occasionally. It happens. It's rare. It happens more often, more and more often, willfully, and sometimes even without will. And, well, I'm considering many options. Tiffany says, Tiffany Curley says, do we require a new religion to get us through the current storm? Or perhaps, Tiffany, an, a new look at existing religion. Moses says, my question and this is a profound one, why do you have the same voice as Tom Cruise? Now that's a first, Moses. Debody says, Kurt, on the AMA, can you do a little digging on Google about creating a time crystal? A new phase of matter has been discovered, and Newton's second law is now destroyed, compelling, and so on. I I haven't looked into that. I tend to not look into what's in the news scientifically, like Scientific America, because there are, on a weekly basis, some announcements about a large physical breakthrough or some new measurement of some mass of some particle, and it breaks all the laws. And then when one looks into the result or the result's been replicated, it, it with more accuracy, the discrepancy goes away. Because of this, I don't pay much attention to what's occurring, and I have plenty on my plate already. There are plenty of puzzles with the existing paradigms. Number two says, when are you going to interview Daniel, Dan, Diana Pasolka? I've already done so, and again, thumbnail here. And I'll just read from the description that I, that I wrote for Diana Pasolka. The recent interview with Diana is one that I'm particularly proud of. Why? Broadly speaking, there are two subsets of the Toe audience. Those interested heavily in the philosophical material slash physics. B, those interested in the UFO-oriented content. While these groups overlap substantially, what's distinct about the Diana episode is that it merges both perspicuously and beautifully. In fact, I blatantly didn't put a UFO tag in the title or the thumbnail. If you're interested in religion and philosophy, then this deep dive is one of the best on tow for audience A. That is the philosophical physics-related subset. While showing how it intersects with the 
quote unquote phenomenon, which is aligned with audience B. This will introduce new topics and models of thinking to each group, though again, A and B are not mutually exclusive. The conversation with Diana was filled with such mutual respect and love, akin to the Carlo Ravelli episode, especially when we were gushing over Heidegger. I see the Toe Project as an extension of Heidegger's main themes, and I consider him to be a row. What is a row? It's an internal name I have. I actually haven't said this aloud yet. It's an internal name. That's false. I mean, I've said it aloud. It hasn't been published. It's an internal name that I have for Resoners of Existence, which I'll expand upon more in an upcoming AMA, which is this. I'll do so shortly. It's a name that I have for the types of people who are trying to understand reality, who don't scorn other approaches like secular or religion or religious traditions. They include Yosha Bach, Castro, Levin, Donald Hoffman, and so on and so on. Okay, so a resoner. What is a resoner? It's a French term, and it's a term of art, which means the person who voices the central theme, philosophy, or point of view of a work of, of, well, of a piece of work. Generally, you see this in movies when someone toward the end of the film encapsulates what the motif was of the film or the point of the film was and does so beautifully. They often do so as if they're speaking to another character, but you can tell it's, it's exposition for us as the audience members passively viewing it. If it's written well, it wouldn't seem like that. So why do I call them resoners of existence? Well, one can think of this like a play in some sense, the story of life. And I feel like there aren't many people who are deeply wrestling or contending with what existence is because most academics feel like, well, it's ill-defined, it's nebulous, you shouldn't even think about it if it's if it's unclear what it means. But yet there are people like Yosha Bach and Bernardo Kastrup and Donald Hoffman and Roger Penrose and Carl Friston and John Verveke and Greg Henriques who are, I'd say, they're investigating fundamental reality from an extremely originative perspective. They don't have a disdain for non-secular spirituality, which is also rare. They have developed their point of view pretty much singularly, and they also have a flair for rigor. So that's the four conditions that I have for a row. Another way that I think about it is in mathematics, there's something called associativity. So there's commutativity, I'm sure you've heard of. X times Y is not the same as Y times X, always. When they are, they're commutative. Then there's associativity, which which has to do with placing brackets around the objects and saying that you can place brackets anywhere. So, as an aside, Chris Fields believes that because quantum mechanics has associativity in it, it implies that observers and self and so on are illusory or could be made to be could be made to have flexible boundaries. But that's that's not always true. There are formulations of quantum mechanics and their unifications of quantum mechanics and general relativity, which are based in the octonians, which are non-associative. So you can't place the brackets anywhere. A times B bracketed times C is not the same as A bracket B times C bracket close bracket. I'm speaking to someone shortly named Tejinder Singh who has an octionic metal, meter, sorry, has an octionic model of the, of unification. Regardless, the point of this was to make the analogy that I view the rows, the resoners of existence, as a non-associative philosophical rat pack. And the, it, it's complicated to, exp, to explain more about what that means, so hopefully this little teaser has, has done so. Oftentimes, people ask me, hey, you should interview this person or this person. And, and sure, the choices in my head come down to yes they have a toe but are they a row perhaps no boris costello says haha man i'd love to know how you get such a rich vocabulary coming from math and physics i i don't boris thank you i'm constantly struggling i appreciate the compliment it's undeserved i i don't personally i don't understand how people can live stream this is extremely intimidating. It's It requires an extreme amount of courage to ex- extemporize unfettered in an unfettered manner. They're either people who live stream are either greatly skilled or they have huge amounts of hardihood, c- courage, valor, and so on, or they are, or I'm greatly unskilled, or, or they're saying someone else's thoughts and it's, 
And the reason I say that is because it's extremely, extremely difficult to think for oneself. It's extremely difficult. It takes me, a, me, for instance, many minutes to articulate sometimes a single thought that I feel like is my own. By the way, Boris is someone that who has been a fan of the Theories of Everything channel for a while and then messaged me on messaged me and said, Hey Kurt, I would love to invite you out to to Montreal and take photos of you because I'm a, a CG artist and I do compositing and here is some of my work. And I looked at it and it was absolutely gorgeous. And here's his Instagram for people who would like to use Boris for their upcoming shoots. He has worked on Marvel films and Star Wars films and continues to do so. His Instagram is at GallicPick. So that is at G-A-L-A-C-P-I-C. And his LinkedIn will be put in the description as well. I recommend you subscribe or follow. I'm unsure of how Instagram works, what the terminology is. His work, because it's it's... It's unparalleled graphic design and photography. It's a combination of both. Thank you again, Boris. It was great to meet you. And soon those photos will come onto the Toe channel and I'll place them somewhere. Maybe I'll do a, a special video about them. Crescendo Bo says, when are you interviewing Chiara Marletto? So whenever she responds to my emails. And again, similarly to Anna Kramer for Stephen Greer, feel free to email Chiara, Chiara Marletto and let her know that hey, perhaps you should come on the Toe channel. It would be great. I would love to see you there. Every email to someone else does help because often mine either goes to spam or they're flooded with many requests that they have to see it repeated in order for them to feel like it's worth it. Mr. Raman says, how difficult is it for you to manage remaining true to the original idea of Toe, meaning having guests, meaning having guests who are scientists and mathematicians or the top-rated videos of the study of UFO phenomenon. There's an obvious monetary difference with these as well. I found your channel I found your channel solely because of the UAP studies. I imagine that this is a struggle for a successful YouTuber such as yourself. Well, Mr. Raman, thank you for I appreciate you calling me successful that it doesn't feel like it, but I appreciate I appreciate that it, it, I come across as that or it, whatever it may be. It's false to think that there's more money in the UFO topic. Actually, there's far more money in the topics of, well, I in two more topics that I won't say. In fact, I've been offered money to interview people, and I don't. In at least one of the cases where someone has offered me money, it's it was more money than I had made at in my entire life for any single year. It's more money than any single year of my annual income. At least up until that point, And that was fairly recently. And I choose not to do so. It took almost everything from me. I remember debating it for, for weeks and weeks with my wife. Should I do so? But it just felt incorrect to go down a route purely for the money. It's another reason why I say, and I'm like, I'm pretending this is all selfless. It's not. It's it's hopefully what I'm doing is for the long term. So it's selfish in the sense that I think it's better in the long run. But like I mentioned, there's timestamps. The reason is that I feel like building a great relationship with the audience and being authentic and ingenuous in the long run will be what serves the quote unquote success that you referred to earlier. Saying being true to the original idea of the toe, that's an interesting way of, of, of putting it because what's the original idea of the toe but to understand sorry the toe the toe channel but to understand the universe almost each scientist would agree that finding life like microbial life would be one of the most groundbreaking discoveries of the entire of of humanity and that's just microbial single-celled life what if something more drastic is occurring far closer what would the implications be for how we understand ourselves what about for physics what about for philosophy if that's not aligned with toe, then I'm unsure what's aligned with toe. We may have different ideas as to what it, as to what the greatest mysteries in the world may be. And some people say, like Diana Pasolka, I heard her say this, and I, I dislike this. I, I have a little bit of a bone to pick with her. I mean this gently, Diana, if you're watching this. She and someone like Gary has also said this too. 
she'll say something like, okay, I'll, I'll answer the following question, but let me do so as a, as a person rather than as a professor. And then she'll give some sui generis perspective. And the reason why I dislike that is because ostensibly the, well, they're afraid of having their wild attitude taint them as a scholar. But to me, one's professorship, their scholarship entails that one should speak honestly and not try to just say what's in the perimeter or the accepted boundaries of discourse. And they should allow authentic speculation, encourage it and put oneself on the line with an unorthodox view because you have tenure, for example, and to play devil's advocate to even the most untenable positions. To me, that's what a professor should do. So when one then says, well, let me take off my professor hat and put on the person hat or the Diana hat, the regular Gary hat or whatever it may be. To me, that's a relinquishing of what it means to be a professor. And I understand what they're saying. They don't want people to think that they're speaking based on the evidence that they've acquired during their scholarly research. But I also think that it gives the wrong impression of what acad of what the academy should be about. And then the question is, well, to what extent does one speculate? I talk about this with with Generation Z that, well, I talk about speculation and the salutary components of speculation. The next question comes from MA7. Can you do a video where you distill conclusions from all the interviews that you've had? By now, I imagine that you've been exposed to the most interesting toes and have developed your own, maybe a reconciled version or, ba or basic outlines. So the crash course on physics, which somewhere is somewhere along here, took a huge amount of time to record and write. And I don't know when the the next video is that I'll do akin to that because I don't particularly like lecturing or giving lessons. And you're asking me for what I've developed. I'm I I am much more interested in pursuing knowledge than I am of conveying knowledge. Even this AMA, by the way, takes weeks and weeks because I have to decoct my thoughts and it means I have to wade through muck, much muck internally to cultivate an articulated thought. Dharma Matart says, have you tried getting Eric Davis for an interview? Yes, I'm working on that. Kenneth Wilbur says, hmm, I wonder if that's... Okay, Kurt, what subject, if any, is entirely untouched by the Toe Channel? Would you like to discuss and why? So I would like to discuss ADHD and learning because those are meta aspects of a toe. So some toes, people who have toes like to use the word meta frequently. And I'd say that there's a meta meta toe, which is about learning, the learning of a toe. At least the more, especially the more physical toes and perhaps even the experiential ones, which need to be, well, the experiential ones, they say that you need to learn and unlearn. I love this parable of, I don't know if it comes from Lao Tzu, but someone said, can you teach me? And then someone said, sure, I'll teach you some Zen master. And they started pouring tea. And then the, the cup overfloweth and kept overflowing. And the student was saying at some point after like 10 minutes said, what are you doing? Stop. You're spilling it everywhere. And then the Zen master said, that's like your mind. That you're coming to me to learn, but your cup is already filled. You need to unlearn. Come to me when your mind is empty. So that's why I said that perhaps the experiential approach is also about unlearning as much as it's about learning. Regardless, this meta aspect of learning, of ADHD and so on, and the practices that one can employ as someone who's learning challenged in this manner is something that I would like to pursue on the Toe channel that I haven't. This next question comes from Christoph Binos. Is there anything legitimate regarding UFOs? Any credible source? Any links to anything tangible? Now, of course, Christos, it depends on what one means by UFO, because plenty is classified as as such. I understand what you mean, though, and I would say that there's no... At least none not that's accessible to the public. There's nothing that is not circumstantial evidence that the public has access to, to suggest that the causal factors, what's behind the UFOs is it's, it's, it's entities. It's precipitated by something that far escapes our current understanding 
or our phylogenetic tree, it's either not a part of it or it's from some aspect of it that we don't currently understand or have a conception of, the circumstantial evidence that does exist is plenty. And I would say that it's more so than either Amber Heard or Johnny Depp had against one another combined, yet the whole world seemed to have placed themselves pertinaciously on one side of the spectrum or one side of the aisle there. The world is a, at least, well, the more one investigates it, the world is a place of, of paradoxical complexity and the familiar is an aberration. And so I don't hold the view that ill-defined and esoteric topics should be viewed upon or explored with scorn or derision. And it took me years and years and years to realize that my criticism that I felt like was dispassionate and purely from a rational perspective was from a place of, of arrogance. I thought it came from a place of reasoning, building up from quote-unquote first principles. I believe myself to be operating from such a place, but I'm deeply skeptical of people who haven't realized that about themselves. I know from personal experience how delusive it can be to think that one is operating from a position of a rational standpoint when virtually all the evidence that we have is that, all, all the psychological evidence we have is that that's decidedly not the case. We're far more, we care far more about our position on a social echelon than we do about almost anything else. And so, well, that was a tangent, and I appreciate the question, Christos. Ali says, what would be the what would be your thoughts on metaphysics in the means of chaos and accidents oriented essence of reality we face now? And how would you eliminate absurdities of living and truth if we take them as the case? Take Nietzsche, take Nietzsche as your rival. I'm sorry, Ali, I don't understand the question. Avesta says, Hey dude, have you heard of the E8 model? So yes, that's someone from that's someone named Garrett Lee's model. And at some point this year, hopefully, I will be speaking to him. Perhaps around the same time I get the chance to take a look at geometric unity. Julian Weinstein <laughs> Weinstein says, To know that consciousness is fundamental, must one experience this directly? Is there any way to, through words or logic, realize that space-time is not fundamental? In other, And by the way, about the space-time not being fundamental, much ado is made about that. And either excoriate, excoriating or venerating Donald Hoffman, but... The majority of physicists don't believe space-time to be fundamental. And it's also not that outlandish to think so. Okay, lastly, what is required to grok this as an altered state neural psychologically, neural physiologically, via psychoactive substances? And what does that say about the causal power of the brain, if anything? So I don't I don't know, Julian. I don't know the answer to your question. All I know is that the last sentence, the causal power power of the brain has embedded in it an assumption of what one is 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 trying to prove or derive from that point so that is assuming that the brain is and is mind independent in some manner than concluding mind independence and all of this is a place that all of this is a decidedly difficult treacherous domain because there are enthymemes everywhere enthymemes being these unstated assumptions that are so embedded and subtle, we don't realize them, that we've made them until years or decades, millennia later. I believe many, many, many of our philosophical problems, perhaps all of them, are like that. Jojo752 says, Kurt, I've been following you for a while now, and I'm glad you've gained such a following. Congrats. Hey, thank you, Joe. My question is, as someone that generally listens to the podcast, not YouTube, is there any chance you could have an email that accompanies your interviews with slides. There's a collective attempt right now on the Discord, so I'll place a link to the Discord somewhere, where people are making notes, show notes for every episode, meticulous. Meticulously, I meticulously timestamp, they meticulously summate, particularly this person named, or this user named Timecake. I'll leave a link to all of that in the description. Curb Killer says, what would you ask a extra extraterrestrial being as a first question if you were the first to get an interview
I don't know if I had one question that's a bit too much pressure. Curb killers. I need to think about that some more. Vincent Marone said, would you ever consider taking your show on the road? Now, a live show, a podcast, a panel with guests and and a stage and so on, that's in the works. I'm There are plans, exciting plans for 2022, like I mentioned, especially 2023. This next question says, how would the academic community react to UAPs being real if they were revealed to be? Well, I think they would do so with... I think that they would have an initial disbelief and then arrogance that UAPs are obviously quote-unquote real and they would lack any reference to their previously derogatory attitude and have no remorseful or little remorseful recognition for those that they've contemned along the way. I don't have a username for you, I'm sorry, but I think that they'll dismiss, they'll cavalierly dismiss those that have believed in UFOs prior to the evidence, quote-unquote, being revealed as, hey, you should only follow the evidence, and so they'll be further cemented, the the, the rationalists, let's say, I, I don't know what else to call them, the Neil deGrasse Tysons, I don't mean to pick on Neil, I'm just, I'm using him as an idol for the, as a representation of the, I don't know what to call it, other than the rationalist or the Neil deGrasse Tysons, that they'll be further entrenched in their view that hey well now we just follow the evidence and it doesn't matter that millions upon millions of people had experiences with these they had they had great intuition sure but that needs to be followed with a different with with evidence and so on i don't think there would be any apology i don't think that there would be any less disparagement i think that the ufo community will get almost no credit for being right about something so so obtuse in the sense that it's so unlikely, at least with our current paradigm, how the heck could you be so likely? How the heck could you follow something and be so correct for so long without meaning that there's something true about the intuition that you followed or the experiences that you've had? And perhaps that means the scientific community needs to expand what they consider to be evidence, or at least expand what they consider to be evidence for avenues for further exploration of a different kind of evidence, concrete evidence, and so on. Well, Stephen says, would you like a cup of tea? I have mine here. I appreciate it, Stephen. It's cold now, extremely cold. Matriarch said, how are you? What are some of your the favorite things that you've learned this past month? What makes these memorable to you? I love this question someone else wrote as a comment, and I hope that he starts, he referring to Kurt, I hope that Kurt starts all his introductions like this. So, if you, if you ask people, let's see, matriarch, matriarch, if you ask people, let me see if I can explain this quickly because it's getting extremely late here. If you were to ask people to take a die, so this is all I have right now, take a die, imagine this is a six-sided cube, Actually, this. So take a die. It's going to keep beeping and beeping. Imagine these. So it says number six up here and the number one down here. They always add up to seven. If you're unaware of that fact, you need to be aware of that. So then five here would be met with a two on the other side because all the numbers add up to seven that are on antipodal points. So then the experimenter says to you, look, you're going to roll this die. It's going to come up with some number. Let's say it comes up with five on the top. You can choose... In your own head, you don't say it aloud. Which number do you want, the top or the bottom? So you're supposed to choose this prior to rolling it. But whatever one you choose, let's say you chose the top number, you get that amount of dollars. So in this case, you rolled five, you're going to get five dollars. If you had chosen the bottom one, remember, this is a private choice. You just tell it to yourself. Then you only get two dollars. Now, how does the investigator know or the experimenter know which one you've chosen, up or down? Well, you tell them after it's been rolled. So you say, you roll it, it lands a six on the top, and you say, oh, oh, I, I, I meant the top. Of course I meant the top. They give you six dollars. You then roll it again. You get a, a four on the top and a, a three on the bottom. And then you say, yes, again, I meant the top. Like, I, I chose top. They give you four dollars. You roll it, and then it gets a two on the top. Then you say, in that case, I meant, a, I meant the bottom one. Like, I, you have no idea. You can't read my mind, but I'm telling you, I'm not lying to you. It's the bottom one that I'd chosen prior to this. Okay, they give they give you five dollars. 
So what happens? Probably what you imagine to happen, which is that people cheat. And the way that you can analyze this without reading someone's mind is at a statistical average level that they tend to earn more than they should if it was statistically random. And you can measure how much they cheat by. And you can also measure that they cheat because they can be clamped down with a lie detect on a lie detector test. And you can see when they're lying. And now you say, well, let's switch the test. And let's say this money that is going to be awarded because you've rolled a die and you've chosen internally up or down prior to the roll, this money is not going to you any longer. It's going to a charity. So then the question is, well, what happens? Does lying increase or decrease? So I thought about this and I thought the lying would decrease because it's for charity. So people feel more moral and people would be aligned, hopefully aligned with the good. And that would remind them of acting correctly. However, it turns out that they lie more. So, okay, that's extremely interesting. Well, why? Well, because even though they're not self-motivated, they feel like, hey, I'm doing something that's, that's good. I'm lying for the greater good. That's why I think it's extremely dangerous to ever to, I think it's extremely dangerous to lie, especially when you think you're quote unquote lying for the greater good, because you'll fool yourself into thinking that there's nothing wrong with it. And then you'll make incremental steps in the direction of, of, of mendacity and dissimulation. Okay. Then you wonder, well, what happens with the lie detector? Do they does it go off even more? Turns out that the lie detector can no longer detect the lies. So that's extremely interesting. Why? Because the lie detector doesn't detect lies per se, it detects tension. So it detects in the initial case that let's say it's number three on the top and four on the bottom. And you had said, I'm going to choose the top one before it rolls. It's three on the top. Then you're like, ah, I want $4. I don't want $3. There's a tension there where you're like, I, I want to be a good person, but I want $4 at the same time. So that is what shows up on the lie detector. However, if now you're lying, quote unquote, for a charity, there's no tension. You're doing what's right. This is one of the reasons why sometimes people who, who lie and, well, people who lie can do so, so charismatically and so fluently and f and fluidly too, because they believe they're doing so for some greater cause. And I'm, I, well, I'm sure you can imagine certain people doing this, but it's, it's better to imagine yourself doing this, oneself doing this. I think it's extremely dangerous to lie in any small case. And especially you think, no, well, the, the edge cases where one is doing it for what's noble is the easiest case. Yes. If it's for the greater good, you lie. I don't know. I think that that's a, a slippery path and it's a path where you don't realize that you're doing it and you have a grandiose vision of yourself and you have no, no dissonance associated with that. So I think it's extremely dangerous. By the way, if you like different formats, if you have different ideas for formats of toe, then, then please do let me know. For example, some people have suggested that I end each episode with my takeaways. I'm not going to do that, but that's a possible format. Another one is end it with a line of poetry that you like or an equation that you find particularly impactful. If you have ideas, let me know. Dan Ako says, what made, what made you originally love the love physics so much? And did you enjoy physics as a kid? I like puzzles. I like logical puzzles and creative problem solving puzzles. And by the way, there are two ways of attacking a theory or some puzzle. So one is to attack it at its root. And then the other is to investigate what ramifies. So the Ramos structure, it's complex and Baroque, and it's difficult to reach unless you know how to climb that tree, which occurs after years and years of laborious lucubration. So alternatively, one can take an ax to the accessible trunk. Like I mentioned, that's the first one. And that's what you can do without ever having to learn the language or the consequences of the, of the, of the intricate implications. The process of of toe is to attempt both. Okay, I realize I'm speaking a bit abstractly. What I'm saying is that one can say in physics, well, look, this is not the correct molecule that one should associate with some phenomenon. Okay, that's chemistry. But then 
what you can do is if you have no clue, you can take a postmodern approach and say, hey, you shouldn't even be relying on science to begin with. And then what you've done is you've somehow answered that question, well, does this molecule fit here or not, by attacking a much more fundamental part. And it's actually the easy way out is to attack the trunk. And you'll see this frequently in the comment sections of other people's videos. Luckily, the Toe channel tends to have great comments, so not here. But you'll see people say, oh, well, all of this is misguided. Don't they see that numbers are are an illusion and mathematics is so-and-so? Well, you're on an Ed Witten video about the moduli space of Ramanian manifolds. And then you say, you have no clue what that means. So then you say, yeah, but it must be false because look, it, mathematics is the wrong approach to begin to begin with. So what one is doing there is attacking the trunk. And that's a valid approach. Well, perhaps it is, perhaps it isn't. Some people would argue. I would say that that's one approach. And then the other is to actually go and, and attempt to, let's say, navigate this the moduli space of Riemannian manifolds and, and to formulate a theory, uh, sorry, a theorem and then prove it. Okay, or disprove it. And that's a difficult, extremely, extremely, extremely difficult part. I happen to like mental puzzles and I tend to like taking an ax because I'm a destructive I'm a destructive person, but at the same time, I happen to like the climbing of the roots. And so, I yes, I've liked physics. That's I've liked physics as a kid. I've liked math as a kid. And I'm attempting with the Toll podcast to, to do both. Okay, JP Velux says, Kurt, if you could have the answer to one question, what would it be? JP, I don't know. That's again, that's a bit too much pressure. Just one question. I don't, I don't know, but there are some, there are questions that I think you should think twice about if you truly want the answer to. Nicholas Ramada says, when is Frank Yang? So I mentioned again that I've, I've haven't been able to study for Frank Yang. Carl Friston and the AH Almas video, you can, are those videos which you can look at to find more information about this. Frank, Yang, thank you so much. You sent me a long email, and and I appreciate it. I haven't had a chance to respond to it, Frank. I'm, I apologize. I hope you know that I'm not I'm not ignoring you. I'm just extremely terrified. Would be one word to take a look at it, or not ready would be perhaps a more copacetic word. At some point, I'll I'll sp I'll speak to you. My my trepidation does seem to be, luckily, reducing with every passing week by the by the glory of the most high god and and i'll and this by the way a phrase from bach i'll be responding to you frank shortly so perhaps in a month or two months or three months okay so frank and nicholas give me some more time i need it, it ameliorates every week like i mentioned it just I need some more time. John John Viz says, when will you get Chris Langan to speak with Eric Weinstein? If they're both interested, then then yes. K says, do you suffer from panic attacks or anxiety-related obstacles in your life? Is socializing difficult? Is diff going out in public places difficult? Sorry if it's too personal, they said. No, so luckily I don't suffer from panic attacks and I don't have agoraphobia. I can go outside in public. I, 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 there's nothing wrong with me in that respect. I, I have gone through a period somewhat recently where almost every other thought was a, an extremely fearful thought. That was about three months straight and I had to carry beta blockers with me, but that's, well, it's mollified now. Luckily, Ink Retchery Studios says, what happened to part two of the Sal Pius interview? I'm going to do it in person with Sal and... Sal would like that as well. We communicate to each other over email occasionally. 
and check in on one another. The timing right now is not right for either of us. Chop Citizen says... Okay, many scientific philosophical discoveries occurred from a correct, concise phrasing of the question that contains the problem, and not from initially conceptualizing the solution. That is to say, do you believe that the framing of the question is often the most important step in the discovery of the solution to that question? I do think that that's the case many of the times. Often in mathematics, there's a phrase that says, make your definitions complex and your proofs simple. Which means, once you have the correct idea of what you're playing around with, then the proofs become trivial. And so certain questions like, well, how was God there before anyone else? How does the causeless happen? And so on. I don't know if how, the quote-unquote how, is the correct frame. And to me, it would be like saying, what time is the pen? Or, or how is the panoply? Well, what the heck does that mean? It, it, perhaps it works at a syntactic level, but not a, at a semantic one. Like the Chomskyan idea of green, colorless ideas that sleep furiously, I believe was it. So the mystic may say that one doesn't need to do all of these verbal gymnastics. It's all a distraction. And Rupert Spira might be on that. They feel like that because they're already on a spiritual bend. But there are large swaths of the population, the majority perhaps, not the minority, but at least a sizable portion, 30%, maybe greater, that aren't attracted to the Eastern and, and mystical method of knowing. And that... One doesn't feel like the answer is, I just need to simply experience life and meditate away into a blissful sea of nothingness. So 30% of the population may feel like, oh, yes, I, I do need to do that. Like, I can see that there's some truth to it, but they, they don't do it. They can't do it. They don't feel like that's, it doesn't jive with them. And, and maybe they don't know how to do it. I don't know how to do that. Not all the time. I've had certain experiences like that. So maybe they don't have a reason to do so enough to motivate them and to find the how. The Toe podcast and the Discord and the community and so on is somewhat helps with this, or at least it comes in. And it's the Toe project or the Toe channel is like a process of explication of a of a left a left brain investigation of a of a right brain phenomenon. It's not because we disregard the the right brain, the experiential. It's 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 because we see the importance of it. We just don't have a, a a ship to sail us from here to that island, to move us from our island to another one. The ships that work for other people, when people say, hey, all you need to do is just meditate and just do so-and-so, they, they don't work. They don't work for, for the logical, analytical brain, at least not for many people. Like I said, perhaps 30% of people. That's in part what attracts that 30% or I think a subset of that 30% to the toe podcast because at least we're admitting that it just doesn't jive with us what I'm doing is trying to construct my own boat and perhaps show by example how others can construct their boat and they can show me at least in the comment section and on the discord and so on how we can sail to the promised land by constructing a boat that is is unexampled. It's just for us. It's particular. And I see the utility in the experiential approach. I also see the utility in the marriage between the experiential and the analytical. And so many of those in the analytical will disregard the experiential. So many in the experiential will contemn and disparage the, the analytical and say, each one is not needed, only my approach. Well, perhaps, perhaps so. Or What's more likely is perhaps that's worked for you. And what what works for you doesn't necessarily work for everyone else. And we all see this. What I think we're all, well, I think many of us are, are tired of being told that what one should do is simply meditate in this manner and simply realize, quote unquote, realize, quote unquote, awaken, awaken, quote unquote, loss of ego, quote-unquote, loss of self. And uh, many of these misappropriated, if I could use that word, misappropriated terms from the East, which actually are heavily laden in, in the culture of the East, and then they're adopted in the West, usually via some psychedelic insight, 
completely disentangled from the communities of the East. If you told them your insights from psychedelics, they say, oh my gosh, you're completely misguided. That's not what we meant at all. You have misunderstood. You've taken a translation, mistranslated it, mistranslated it, and then adopted it into English singularly when it should have been from the source, from our culture, in our culture with multiple people. And it's not just an insight that you get alone. It's something you work through with a with a with a sangha, is what Diana Pasolka said, with a community of people. So perhaps there's something amiss with the analytical approach. Perhaps there's something amiss with the experiential approach, but perhaps there's utility in both, and perhaps there's utility in the marriage between them. Slow says, do you have a synthesis of the top concepts and theories you've learned from your guests? It's all disconnected currently. I need to, sp I need to spend more time integrating rather than, rather than learning and then going on to the next one and then learning and learning. Logan says, what were you like in high school? Did you have a hard time fitting in? Did you win any awards? Did you know what you wanted to do in life? I... I had no hard time fitting in. There was no popular crowd, unlike what you see in the movies, at least not in my high school. There were there's certainly unpopular crowds, but I wasn't in one of them. Awards, I think I won an award or two. I, I don't recall. My physics teacher was kind to me and gave me great grades, even though I didn't do the assignments. He saw that he he saw he said there was po extreme potential in me and I was just like, I was so lazy. I wouldn't do the tests. Sorry, I would do extremely well on tests, but I would get zeros in the homework and I didn't hand them in. In fact, I fought with one of my math teachers because he made me do matrix multiplication for pages and pages. And I remember thinking, what's the point of this? This is not even a linear transformation. You're just getting me to multiply rows and columns together. So I had to go, I went to the school board and then the school board sided with me. Well... I don't know how I had the courage to to do that as a high schooler to go up against the teacher like that, but I guess my 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 unindustriousness got the better of me. And as far as what I wanted to do in life, I wanted to be a mathematician, I believe, or a physicist. I wanted, in particular, to solve the Riemann hypothesis and come up with a toe with the theory of everything. So the signs of of hubristic behavior were apparent at an extremely early age. Lar Bowler said, Amazing, Kurt. I really hope this is a thing. My number one question would be, how do you deal with depression? I, I, luckily, I don't have depression. I'm, I'm super lucky. I don't have feelings of sadness almost ever, except, well, they're short lived and they're with respect to watching a movie or a story or seeing something on, seeing an image or, or a video. And it's not persistent. It's more about, well, I don't have persistent sadness at all. Where do you see yourself in f <clears throat> one to five to ten years? <clears throat> five years, ten years, who knows? Who knows? One year, I have some plans. I have plenty of plans. Pale Horse says, what is your mission in life? I... I... I don't... I'm sorry, Pale Horse. I don't know how to answer that. I, I, have, an, I have an answer, but it would take me far too long to dredge it up from the depths to dredge it is that the correct word let me see yes that's correct so to dredge up from the depths antagonist says last question antagonist number three how are you right now i'm exhausted i've been doing this for almost 12 hours straight now because i had some podcasts earlier today one with Gen Z, another with Greg Henriques, and then prepping for this. And then, well, I don't need to go through what I was up to and what I'm going to do after this. It's 9 p.m. I should have finished at, I was planning on finishing at 5 p.m. or so. 5 p.m. for the latest. And I have these lights here, and these are what are called sad lamps, I believe, seasonal affective disorder. Not that I, I have that. Luckily, I don't suffer from any such condition, but... It's it's just because they're extremely lightweight lamps. They mimic the UV. Sorry, they mimic the the light of the sun for people who have seasonal affective disorder. I forgot what they're called. Happy lamps. Regardless, the point is that this is going to keep me up now because it's 9 p.m. and I'm still looking at these lights. They should have shut off at 6 p.m. So I'm feeling a bit flustered from that. 
I'm feeling extremely grateful that people are interested in in the Theories of Everything podcast. I'm wondering what the heck is my wife doing? She probably urinated 10 times over in that bedroom and just shaking her fist, wondering when the hell am I going to finish this and having her ear against the door thinking, is this over? This was supposed to be over two hours ago. What the heck is happening? So I'm going to go check in on her. If you're wondering what I'm referring to, this is a reference to the fact that we have a fairly tiny condo with only one washroom, which is directly behind me. During podcasts, my poor wife has to wait in the room with plastic cups to urinate in, unfortunately, until we can move out to a, another place. I, I'm also thinking, what else do I have to do? So I, I'm hot. I am happy. Hot as in temperature wise, because I haven't turned on the air conditioning yet. I'm extremely happy about about finishing this, about, well, I'm, I'll just say I'm happy, and I appreciate the question, antagonist number three. Thank you all for watching. Again, if you're interested in supporting the theories of everything podcast then do consider going to patreon.com slash kurt j mungo there'll probably be another reference of this toward the end there is it's a standard audio that gets played and and i i just appreciate you well i 160,000 subscribers holy moly that's great i have many many plans for this this is just the beginning i thought that the toe podcast would end in three years i remember thinking that and saying that i think in the first ama i now see it extending out to seven years so seven years from this point so maybe 2029 or 2028 and there are there well i'm i'm just extremely excited to show you what's coming up plenty is on the horizon thank you Thank you all, and have a great night. The podcast is now finished. If you'd like to support conversations like this, then do consider going to patreon.com slash C-U-R-T-J-A-I-M-U-N-G-A-L. That is Kurt Jaimungle. It's support from the patrons and from the sponsors that allow me to do this full-time. Every dollar helps tremendously. Thank you.